Chapter 4 of Narrative of an Expedition to the Shores of the Arctic Sea in 1846 and 1847 by John Ray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schempf. Chapter 4 State of Things at Repulse Bay. Determined to discontinue the survey till the spring. Reasons Party sent to bring over the boat fix on a site for winter residence ptarmigan laughing geese eider and king ducks visits of natives too frequent return of the party sent for the boat report the bay more closely packed than before preparations for wintering fort hope built proceed to north pole and christie lakes to look out for fishing stations purchase dogs weariness of the deer flocks of geese pass southward blue-winged and snow geese their habits snowstorm its effects return to fort hope daily routine signs of winter deer numerous quantity of game killed provision store built of snow great fall of snow Effects of the cold. Adventure with a deer. Visited by a party of natives. Their report of the ice westward of Melville Peninsula. An island said to be wooded. Produce of the chase in October. Temperature. Two observatories built of snow. Band of wolves. A party caught in a snowstorm. Eskimo theory of the heavenly bodies. Temperature of November. Diminished supply of provisions. On our arrival at Repulse Bay, we found the men all well, but getting no more fish and venison than was barely sufficient to support them. Having taken but a scanty breakfast, I fully enjoyed my dinner here, but I reversed the usual order of eating the same, taking my venison steak first, it being soonest cooked, and salmon as a second course. This was to me the most anxious period during the expedition, nor will this appear strange when I mention that it was necessary to decide, and that promptly, on one of two modes of proceeding, namely whether to leave the whole survey to be completed during the following spring and summer, or to endeavor to follow it up this autumn, after mature consideration, I determined on adopting the first of these measures, and giving up all hopes of prosecuting the survey at present. My reason for arriving at this conclusion I shall briefly mention, as such a step may appear rather premature. I saw from the state of the ice and the prevalence of northerly winds that there was no probability of completing the whole of the proposed survey this season and although part of the coast, either towards the Strait of Fury and Hecla, or towards Decent Simpson's farthest, might be traced, yet to accomplish even this might detain us so long that there would be no time to make the necessary preparations for wintering, and we should thus be under the necessity of returning to Churchill without accomplishing the object of the expedition, or, if we remained at Repulse Bay, run the risk of starving for I could obtain no promise of supplies from the natives, and all the provisions we had carried with us would not go far to support the party throughout the winter. We should thus have to depend almost, if not altogether, upon our own exertions for the means of existence both in regard to food and fuel. It ought to be borne in mind that we were differently situated from any party that had hitherto gone to these cold and barren regions, the resources of the country were quite unknown to us. It was not likely that the deer would remain near at hand all winter, as we were at too great a distance from the woods, and it was very evident, for the same reason, that we should not be able to procure any sort of fuel after the first fall of snow, which there was little doubt would occur some time in September. Before reaching the Arctic Sea to the west of Melville Peninsula, I was, for various reasons, inclined to agree with the opinion of Sir John Ross, that Boothia was part of the continent of America. This opinion was strengthened when I observed the great rise and fall of the tide, which must have affected the tides of the Castor and Pollux River, 
had there been a strait of any width separating boothia from the mainland unless indeed the assumption of captain sir j ross that the sea to the west of boothia stands at a higher level than that on the east side be correct in that case there would be a continual easterly current which could scarcely fail to have been noticed by so acute an observer as simpson retaining one man with myself to guard our stores and attend the nets on the eleventh i sent over the remaining six to assist in bringing over the boat Uligbuck had now been about two days looking for deer, and I began to feel anxious about him, when he made his appearance between nine and ten a.m. with the venison of a young deer on his back. As soon as my companion had returned from the nets, out of which he got no fish, I took a walk for the purpose of looking out for fishing stations, and a site for our winter house. For the latter, I could find no better place than a narrow but not deep valley within a few hundred yards of our landing place, and about a hundred and fifty from North Pole River on its east side. There appeared to be various small bays along the shore to the eastward, which were likely to produce fish. A flock of laughing geese, answer albifrons, flew past quite close to me, but having only my rifle, I could but send a ball after them and missed as was to be expected in a small pond an eider duck was observed with her young brood apparently not more than twelve days old the male eider and king ducks had already left this quarter having migrated to the southward twelfth a cloudy day with a strong breeze from north northwest two salmon and a trout were got from the nets but uligbuck killed no deer in the evening when on my way to set a net in a lake at no great distance i fell in with a covey of ptarmigan t rupestris most of the young being strong on the wing and bagged eighteen brace in an hour or two knocking down those birds on this day made me half fancy myself among the grouse in my own barren native hills on the thirteenth the weather was raw and cold with frequent showers and a gale of wind from the same quarter as the day before four salmon were caught and a deer was shot the thermometer varied from thirty six degrees to thirty eight degrees four eskimo men and two women visited us today the fourteenth was much like the thirteenth but there was no rain as the visits of the natives had now become rather frequent and as they brought nothing with them but appeared to expect both food and presents i bade uligbuck say that we could not afford to feed them any longer and that they had better return to their huts where i knew they were killing deer enough to support themselves on returning from my daily walk i found that our friends had taken leave rather hurriedly having been detected appropriating some salt fish which they could not eat for this they were sharply reprimanded by the interpreter and one of the ladies was most ungallantly accused by her husband of being the offender corrigal and i hauled the seine in the evening and caught thirty-three salmon fourteen more were got out of the nets fifteenth this was a beautiful day throughout in the evening the sky being clear and cloudless some stars were visible and a few streaks of orange-coloured aurora showed themselves to the southward the seine was again hauled and thirty-two salmon some of them very small caught whilst the nets produced eleven more just as we were landing our fish, the men who had been taking over the boat made their appearance, being a day earlier than I expected. By keeping the proper route, three of the portages were avoided, and they had the advantage of a fine fair breeze all through the lakes. The large bay, Akkuli, was reported as being more closely packed with ice than before. This was nothing but what I should have expected after the late northwesterly winds the two eskimo arkshuk and ivitchuk anglis aurora and walrus who had been engaged to aid in dragging the boat over the portages had wrought well and readily accommodated themselves to the habits of the men they were well recompensed and ivitchuk a merry little fellow was engaged to accompany me on my intended spring journeys the boat was for the present left at north pole lake as it might still be required there the sixteenth was a day of rest and the seventeenth was so stormy and wet that little work could be done 
all hands were now busily employed making preparations for a long and dreary winter for this purpose four men were set to work to collect stones for building a house whilst the others were occupied in setting nets hunting deer and gathering fuel our work was much impeded by rainy weather particularly the house building as the clay or mud was washed away as soon as applied we found that our nets were so much cut up by the small marine insect from half to three-quarters of an inch long resembling a shrimp in miniature the favorite food of the salmon that it was quite impossible to keep them in repair i thought to destroy their taste for hemp by steeping the nets in a strong decoction of tobacco but it had no effect on the second september our house was finished its internal dimensions were twenty feet long by fourteen feet broad height in front seven and a half feet sloping to five and a half at the back we formed a very good roof by using the oars and masts of our boats as rafters and covering them with oilcloth and moose skin the latter being fixed to the lower or inside of the rafters whilst the former was placed on the outside to run off the rain the door was made of parchment deerskins stretched over a frame of wood the walls were fully two feet thick with three small openings in which a like number of windows each having two panes of glass were placed our establishment was dignified with the name of fort hope and was situated in sixty six degrees thirty two minutes sixteen seconds north longitude by a number of sets of lunar distances with objects on both sides of the moon eighty six degrees fifty five minutes fifty one seconds west the variation of the compass on thirtieth august was sixty two degrees fifty minutes thirty seconds west mean dip of the needle and the mean twice of the hundred vertical vibrations in the line of declination two hundred and twenty six seconds a sort of room was formed at one end by putting up a partition of oilcloth in this besides its serving as my quarters all our pemmican and some of the other stores were stowed away from the fifth to the thirteenth i was up at north pole and christie lakes in the boat with three men our object being to look out for fishing stations and also to purchase dogs from the eskimo the wind being from the north we did not reach the eskimo encampment till the tenth they had shifted their tents from the narrows to a small point about eight miles up christie lake where the deer were more numerous among which they seemed to have made great havoc to judge by the abundance of skins and venison lying in all directions our friends were delighted to see us and had improved much in appearance the only poor animals about them being their dogs which appeared to get no more to eat than was barely sufficient to keep them in life i looked out four of the best being all i wanted at present for which i promised a dagger each intending to take them with us on our return during our stay here a band of deer came to the edge of the lake and after feeding a short time took the water three of the natives slipped noiselessly into their kayaks and lay waiting until the deer were far enough out in the water to intercept them but just as they were on the eve of starting the wind changed a little and the deer smelling their enemy wheeled about and were soon in safety on the beach from which they had started many large flocks of hutchins and snow geese had been seen for the last few days passing to the southward the blue-winged goose of edwards is by some ornithologists considered as the young of the last named bird in one of its stages towards maturity but this opinion i believe to be erroneous for the following reasons during a ten years residence at moose factory on the shores of hudson's bay i had many opportunities every spring and autumn of observing both the snow and blue-winged goose in their passage to and from their breeding places the marshes near moose being favorite feeding ground in the spring both species are very nearly alike in size the blue-winged goose although shorter being rather the heavier bird in the autumn there are four distinct varieties two of which exactly resemble in size and plumage those seen in the spring whilst the others are much smaller and differ much from these and from each other in their markings the young of the snow goose being a light gray color darkest on the head and the upper part of the neck 
while the young of the blue-winged goose is of a dark slate color approaching to black on the head and neck neither do the young separate from the old as has been asserted for families may be seen feeding by themselves all over the marshes the old bird keeping a sharp lookout and giving timely warning to her brood of any approaching danger in fact the indian who has thoroughly studied the habits of the bird takes advantage of her affection for her young and of their attachment to their parent to make both his prey well knowing that the young are easily decoyed by imitating their call and by mock geese set up in the marsh and that the old bird although more shy will follow them he waits patiently until she comes within range if he shoots her he is pretty sure to kill the greater part of the others as they continue to fly over and around the place for some time after during the night of the tenth when near the north end of the lake we experienced one of the severest snowstorms i ever witnessed as we were sleeping on the shore we never thought of putting up any sort of shelter the consequence was that in the morning we were covered with snow to the depth of a foot our boat which had been hauled up on the beach was blown away from her fastenings and carried several hundred yards into the lake among some stones being the only one of the party provided on the spot with mackintosh boots it fell to my lot to wade out to the boat throw overboard the ballast lift her bows over the stones and take a line to the shore which from having miscalculated the depth of the water i found a more disagreeable task than i had expected fortunately the boat sustained no injury it was now about six o'clock in the morning of the eleventh and as the storm continued unabated we made sort of a tent of our sails in doing this the men got so wet and cold from the snow thawing on them that they could not even light their pipes in the afternoon the weather improved and we were able to scrape a little fuel together with which we cooked some salmon and boiled a kettle of tea which made us feel quite comfortable again we thus combined breakfast dinner and supper in one meal the hares had already acquired their winter coat and the golden plovers and sandpipers had all disappeared but some lapland and snow buntings and the shore lark were still to be seen a little after noon on the thirteenth the wind shifted to the southwest and we got under way to return home a couple of hours brought us to the eskimo where we stopped to take on board our dogs a young lad also came with us to carry some medicine for the patriarch of the tribe who was laboring under various complaints peculiar to old age we arrived at north pole river at six p m having had a beautiful run all the way as we were not likely to require the boat on the lakes again this season she was hauled up and placed in security for the winter while at the lake we had not been able to procure much more food than was necessary for our own use but this may in part have been attributable to the bad weather the storm on the tenth had been much felt at our house and so great was its force that the boat left there was lifted a few yards by it but received no injury much heavy ice was driven into the bay and lay heaped up all along the shore our house was still far from comfortable the clay being quite wet and producing a most unpleasant feeling of dampness far more disagreeable than a much lower temperature with dry weather our time was now continually occupied in collecting fuel portions of which as soon as it became dry were built up into small heaps on the rocks near the house in fishing and in shooting deer and partridges the routine of our day's work was as follows in the morning we were up before daylight the men got their orders for the several duties they had to perform which were principally carried on out of doors and at which they set to work immediately after rolling up their bedding and taking breakfast this meal usually consisted of boiled venison the water with which it was cooked being converted into a very excellent soup by the addition of some deer's blood and a handful or two of flour our dinner or rather supper consisted of the same materials as our breakfast and was taken about four or five o'clock after that my time was employed in writing my journal or making calculations whilst the men were busy improving themselves in reading arithmetic etc in which i assisted them as much as my time would permit 
divine service was read every sunday when practicable on the twentieth the pools of water were covered with ice sufficiently strong to be walked upon and on the twenty eighth some hooks were set under the ice on the lakes for trout during the latter part of the month deer were very numerous as many as seventeen were shot on the twenty eighth and on the following day ten more were got seven of which were killed by myself within a few miles of the house on the twenty ninth a considerable portion of the bay was frozen over and the seals were seen popping up their heads every now and then through the ice to keep breathing places open the weather during this month having been very changeable and stormy and unfavorable for observations of all kinds the sextant had frequently been exchanged for the rifle a not unwelcome exchange to one addicted to field sports from his youth upwards our sporting book for the month showed that we had been doing something towards laying in a stock of provisions for winter sixty-three deer five hares one seal one hundred seventy two partridges and one hundred sixteen salmon and trout had been brought in october during the first part of this month some of the men were employed in building a store of snow for our provisions and covering it with two of the sails on the twelfth and the three following days there was one continued storm which drifted the snow all round the house as high as the roof and on the night of the fifteenth would have choked all our dogs that were chained outside had not adamson and another got up and cut their fastenings on the sixteenth when it cleared up the thermometer first fell to zero the cold had now penetrated indoors and frozen the clay on the walls which made us much more comfortable on attempting to open some books that had been lying on a shelf i was surprised to find that the leaves were all frozen together when i mentioned this and also that our powder horns and every other article that was bound with brass or silver burst their fastenings some idea may be formed of the dampness of our house whilst the clay on the walls was wet on the nineteenth when out shooting having killed one deer i went in pursuit of another a large buck that had been wounded and put four balls through him thinking that the last ball had settled the business for he had fallen i went carelessly up to him without reloading my rifle and when within a few yards i believe i apostrophized the animal much in the following strain ah poor fellow you are done for at last when the deer as if he had understood what i said and thought i was adding insult to injury sprung to his legs in a moment and at a couple of bounds his horns were within a foot of me circumstanced as i was i thought with falstaff that discretion was the better part of valor and beat a hasty retreat laughing heartily all the time at the strange figure we must have made taking the deer by the horns could have been of no use and might have cost me some troublesome bruises and scratches twelve eskimo and a boy visited us on the twenty-third among whom was the man named shimakuk to whom the sledge belonged part of which we had used for fuel when near cape lady pelly with the boat he was now rewarded and apparently so much to his satisfaction that he would have had no objection to having another sled burnt on the same terms they reported that the bay to the west of melville peninsula had been packed full of ice ever since we were over there until a few days before they came away when there was some open water to be seen besides purchasing five dozen reindeer tongues a seal skin full of oil and some other articles we added two good dogs to our team among other information they told me that there was an island in akuli the large bay west of melville peninsula named shatuk which means low or flat on which large trees grew but they acknowledged that none of them had ever been on the island although they had been near enough to see the trees distinctly in this i believe their imaginations had deceived them aided perhaps in some degree by a peculiar state of the atmosphere during which the appearance of the land has been so distorted that it was mistaken for woods some round sticks probably spars belonging to one of the two vessels left in prince regent's inlet having been picked up along the west shore of melville peninsula had no doubt strengthened the opinion they had formed two of their party whom we had never seen were drowned in miles lake by falling through the ice 
the one in chasing a deer and the other it is supposed in attempting to save his companion our visitors left us on the twenty fifth promising to return soon with some deerskin dresses during the whole of the month we were occupied much the same way as in the previous one deer were numerous during the first part of it but scarce laterly sixty-nine were shot but the produce of our nets had fallen very low eighteen salmon and four trout being all we caught the highest temperature of the month was thirty-eight degrees whilst the lowest was fifteen degrees although there was a great deal of very stormy weather there was some clear calm nights of which i took advantage to obtain lunar distances two observatories had been built of snow with a pillar of ice in each at the suggestion of captain lefroy r a the one for the dip circle the other for a horizontally suspended needle to try the effects of the aurora upon it so much snow had fallen that it lay four feet deep on the roof of our meat store and was near breaking the masts which supported it so that we were obliged to raise its walls about a fathom to prevent such an occurrence in future on the fourth november when out looking for deer a little before daylight in the morning i observed a band of animals coming over a rising ground at a quick pace directly towards me i at first supposed them to be deer but on nearer approach they proved to be wolves seventeen in number they continued to advance at full speed until within forty yards when they formed a sort of half circle to leeward hoping to send a ball through one of them i knelt down and took what i thought a sure aim at a large fellow that was nearest unfortunately it was not yet broad daylight and the rascals all kept end on to me so that the ball merely cut off a line of hair and a piece of skin from his side they apparently did not expect to meet with such a reception for after looking at me a second or two they trotted off no doubt as much disappointed at not making a breakfast of me as i was at missing my aim had they come to close quarters which they sometimes do when pressed hard for food i had a large and strong knife which would have proved a very efficient weapon on my way home i shot three hares on the fifth two partridges were shot which very much resembled the tetrato salicetti but which i supposed to be the t mutus the parasite found on them differed from those usually found on the willow grouse we began during this month to find that we could not afford fuel to dry our clothes i therefore adopted the plan that a celebrated miser took to warm his food by taking them under the blankets with me at night and drying them by the heat of the body this it may be supposed was not very agreeable particularly when the weather became colder for the moisture froze during the day on the blankets which sparkled with hoar-frost when i went to bed in the afternoon of the ninth we had one of the most severe snowstorms that had yet been experienced and i was much alarmed at the non-arrival of four men who had gone in the morning to examine some nets and set others in north pole lake eight miles from the house guns were fired to attract the attention of the party who made their appearance at half past eight p m when we had given up all hopes of seeing them until the following day they had been upwards of eight hours in coming as many miles and were like walking pillars of snow when they came in the four dogs they had with them were still missing having run off with the sled as soon as they smelt the house on the following day they were found entangled with one another and the sled stuck fast against some rocks one or two of the dogs were completely covered up with snow but all safe about two p m on the twenty fifth two eskimo men and a boy named arkshuk aurora borealis took ulak the falling stick and chemikti snuff came to see us with deerskin clothes etc for barter i had a good deal of conversation through the interpreters with arkshuk whom i found rather intelligent and communicative it appears that the favorite food of these eskimo is muskox flesh venison ranks next and bear and walrus are preferred to seal and fish their theory regarding the sun and moon is rather peculiar it is said that many years ago not long after the creation of the world there was a mighty conjurer eskimo of course who gained so much power that at last he raised himself up into the heavens taking with him his sister a beautiful girl and a fire 
to the latter he added great quantities of fuel which thus formed the sun for some time he and his sister lived in great harmony but at last they disagreed and he in addition to maltreating the lady in many ways at last scorched one side of her face she had suffered patiently all sorts of indignities but the spoiling of her beauty was not to be borne she therefore ran away from him and formed the moon and continues so until this day her brother is still in chase of her but although he sometimes gets near he will never overtake her when it is new moon the burnt side of the face is towards us when the full moon the reverse is the case the stars are supposed to be the spirits of dead eskimo that have fixed themselves in the heavens and falling stars or meteors and the aurora borealis are those spirits moving from one place to another whilst visiting their friends the highest lowest and mean temperature of november were respectively plus twenty eight degrees minus twenty five degrees and plus zero point six eight only twelve deer nine hares and a few partridges had been shot whilst our nets produced about sixty fish the greater part of which were small end of chapter four chapter five of narrative of an expedition to the shores of the arctic sea in eighteen forty six and eighteen forty seven by john ray this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil Schempf. chapter five winter arrangements completed learn to build snow houses christmas day north pole river frozen to the bottom first january cheerfulness of the men furious snowstorm observatories blown down boat buried under the snow Wooling buck caught in the storm dog attacked by a wolf party of natives take up their residence near fort hope eskimo mentioned by sir john ross known to them boat dug out of the snow a runaway wife deer begin to migrate northward a wolf chase first deer of the season shot difficulty of deer hunting in spring dimensions of an eskimo canoe serious accident to Ulingbuck. a conjurer preparations for the journey northward temperature aurora borealis during december we completed our various buildings and formed passages under the snow so that we could without exposure go to any of them there were four houses viz one for provisions another for fuel a third for oil dog's meat etc and a fourth for the men's spare luggage for which there was no room in the dwelling house and which had been stowed in the tents until it was found necessary to take them down being desirous of requiring as little assistance from the eskimo as possible i attempted to build a snow house after the native fashion and succeeded tolerably well finding that the process was not so difficult as i anticipated after a few trials one or two of the men became very good masons we had now no encouragement to move much about as there was no game to be seen and the weather was very unsettled and consequently no more exercise was taken than was necessary to keep us in good health in stormy weather not being able to get out of doors the men wrestled or played some game which called the muscles into action and thus kept up the animal heat on the twenty first the sun's lower limb rose about double his diameter above the rising ground to the southward on a level with fort hope on the twenty third and twenty fourth whilst looking out some good venison for our christmas dinner we examined our stock of such provisions and found that we had not enough to last us until the return of the deer in spring fortunately we still had a good supply of pemmican left christmas day was passed very agreeably but the weather was so stormy and cold that only a very short game at football could be played short as it was however it was sufficiently amusing for our faces were every moment getting frost-bitten either in one place or another so as to require the continual application of the hand and the rubbing running about and kicking the ball at the same time produced a very ludicrous effect our dinner was composed of excellent venison and a plum pudding with a moderate allowance of brandy punch to drink a health to absent friends 
for some time past washing the face had been rather an unpleasant operation as any water that got among the hair froze upon it immediately this is mentioned by sir george back as having occurred once to him at fort reliance in eighteen thirty three on the twenty eighth north pole river got frozen to the bottom so that we were forced to go to a lake to the southwest of beacon hill about half a mile distant for water the first of january was as beautiful a day as we could have wished to begin the new year with there was a light air of wind and the temperature varied from minus twenty three degrees to minus twenty six degrees after a most excellent breakfast of fat venison steaks all the party were occupied for some hours with a spirited game at football at which there was much fun the snow being so hard and slippery that several pairs of heels might be seen in the air at the same time my dinner consisted of part of a hare and a reindeer tongue with a currant pudding as second course the men's mess was much like my own except that they had venison instead of hare a small supply of brandy was served out and on the whole i do not believe that a more happy company could have been found in america large as it is tis true that an agreeable companion to join me in a glass of punch to drink a health to absent friends to speak of bygone times and speculate on the future might have made the evening pass more pleasantly yet i was far from unhappy to hear the merry joke the hearty laugh and lively song among my men was of itself a source of much pleasure on the seventh the tracks of a few deer were unexpectedly seen within a few miles of the house and on the following day the thermometer showed a temperature of minus forty seven degrees the lowest we experienced during the winter the ninth was a more disagreeable day than any we had yet had a storm from the north with thick snowdrift and a temperature of seventy two degrees below the freezing point made it feel bitterly cold fortunately we had some days before made a house for our dogs else they must have inevitably been frozen to death such was the force of the gale for two days that both observatories were completely demolished and wherever the snow banks projected in the slightest degree above the surrounding level they were worn away by the friction of the snowdrift as if cut with a knife the thermometer indoors varied from twenty nine degrees to forty degrees below the freezing point which would not have been unpleasant where there was a fire to warm the hands and feet or even room to move about but where there was neither the one nor the other some few degrees more heat would have been preferable as we could not go for water we were forced to thaw snow and take only one meal each day my waistcoat after a week's wearing became so stiff from the condensation and freezing of my breath upon it that i had much trouble to get it buttoned the gale did not subside until the fifteenth when we were busily employed repairing the damages done by the wind and drift as a great weight of snow had lodged upon our boat we were afraid she might be injured by the pressure and some of the men were employed to search for her but there was some difference of opinion about her exact situation and it was two days before she was found after digging to the depth of eight feet a stick was set up at one end of the boat that there might be no difficulty in finding the place again one cause of discomfort to me was the great quantity of tobacco smoke in our low and confined house it being sometimes so thick that no object could be seen at a couple of yards distance the whole party with the exception of myself were most inveterate smokers indeed it was impossible to be awake for ten minutes during the night without hearing the sound of the flint and steel striking a light of course i might to a great extent have put a stop to this but the poor fellows appeared to receive so much comfort from the use of the pipe that it would have been cruelty to do so for the sake of saving myself a trifling inconvenience this month was so stormy that the most of our time when we could get out of doors was passed in clearing away the snow that drifted about our doors and over the house and in rebuilding and repairing the boat and also the stick that had been set up as a mark were completely covered over on the eighteenth uligbuck had gone out to hunt and did not return until the twenty fifth after i had given up all hopes of ever seeing him again in life it appeared that he had visited the Eskimos at Christie Lake for the purpose of speaking to them about not having kept their promise regarding some oil that they said they would bring to us and which they had omitted to do. He had been caught by the storm of the 18th before he reached his friends and was obliged to build a snow hut 
in which he passed the night comfortably enough on the following morning when it cleared up a little he found that he was not more than two hundred yards from his destination which the thickness of the weather on the previous day had prevented him from seeing one of the dogs we had lent this party to aid in drawing some provisions to the coast had a narrow escape from a wolf having broken loose she set out on her return home when she was attacked by the wolf and treated much in the same way that tam o'shanter's mare was by cutty sark for the wolf had caught her by the rump and left poor surrey scarce a stump on the last day of january some eskimo who were to take up their quarters near us arrived with part of their luggage and provisions and built their snow house near the south side of beacon hill this would have been the best situation for our establishment as it was completely sheltered from the northerly gales but we were too late in making the discovery i visited the eskimo on the first february and found the old man named shishak and his wife in their comfortable house which was so warm that my waistcoat which had been frozen quite stiff for some time past actually thawed it was not easy to learn any of the peculiarities of these people as ulingbuck was rather shy about describing their habits ulingbuck's son informed me that even in winter they strip off all their clothes before going to bed when taking a walk on the third i passed near the eskimo and found one of them repairing the runners of his sledge the substance used was a mixture of moss chopped up fine and snow soaked in water lumps of which are firmly pressed on the sledge with the bare hand and smoothed over so as to have an even surface the process occupied the man nearly an hour during the whole of which time he did not put his hands in his mitts nor did he appear to feel the cold much although the temperature was thirty degrees below zero on the fourth ulligbuck set his gun for a wolf that had been prowling about for the last few days the usual mode is to fix the gun to two sticks with its muzzle pointed to a bait placed at the distance of fifteen or twenty yards with a line attached to it the other end of which is fastened to the trigger but ulligbuck's plan was quite different from this he enclosed the gun in a small snow house in such a manner that there was nothing visible but the bait which was not more than a foot from the muzzle so that the shot could scarcely miss the head of the animal when ulligbuck went to his gun next morning he saw the track of the wolf and followed it to the dog kennel in which he had comfortably taken up his quarters he immediately took the brute by the tail and dragged him outside much against his will when he was soon dispatched with an ice chisel this animal was very large but in the last stage of starvation with a severe arrow or gunshot wound in one thigh he measured five feet nine inches from the nose to the tip of the tail the length of tail one foot seven inches and his height at the shoulder was two feet eight inches on the seventh a man named aki Ulik, who had promised us four seal skins of oil arrived and said that he could only let us have one because the bears had broken into his cache and devoured nearly all its contents this story i did not believe at the time and i afterwards found out that it was false i felt a good deal annoyed at the man's not keeping his promise because we had depended much upon this supply for fuel and light to save the former we had during part of the last month taken only one meal a day and discontinued the comfort of a cup of tea with our evening repast of oil our stock was so small that we had been forced to keep early and late hours namely lying occasionally fourteen hours in bed as we found that to sit up in a house in which the temperature was some degrees below zero without either light or fire was not very pleasant fortunately we all enjoyed excellent health and our few discomforts instead of causing discontent furnished us with subjects of merriment for instance hutchison about this time had his knee frozen in bed and i believe the poor fellow who by the by was the softest of the party was afterwards very sorry for letting it be known as he got so heartily laughed at for his effeminacy on the ninth one of the eskimo women wife of kik tuu that came to see us had a brass wheel one and one-third to two inches in diameter fastened on her dress as an ornament it was evidently part of some instrument probably of some of those left by sir john ross at victoria harbour i wished to purchase it but she would not part with it fifteenth 
Akiulik brought over a large and heavy hoop of iron, which had been at one time round the rudder head, bowsprit end, or masthead of a vessel. As he said, it had been taken off a large stick. I did not buy it from him, as he was in disgrace for having disappointed me about the oil. About 1 p.m. on the same day, a number of the natives paid us a visit, among whom were Abuji, Ivitchuk, and Utu Uniak, three of the most decent and best behaved of the party they brought us a quantity of venison of which they still had a large stock and some of which they were now willing to dispose of as they found that they had more than was requisite for their own consumption they had frequently seen ubluria ikmalik and some of the other eskimo mentioned by sir john ross and i also further learnt that the man with the wooden leg named tulu ahiu was dead but how long since i could not discover the greater part of the men had been employed for the last fourteen days digging away the snow from the boat to relieve her from the pressure as she was covered up to the depth of more than twelve feet this was no easy task however we managed it in the following manner having cut a narrow opening through the snow down to the boat we erected a tackle over it and hoisted up the loose snow as it was removed with spades and axes after excavating a space the full length of the boat and clearing the snow out of it the bow and stern were alternately raised and the blocks of snow which were chopped from the top pushed underneath to prevent it sinking down again in this way the men could work without exposure and when the weather was stormy the hole was covered with a sail so that the snowdrift could not interfere with our labours we had yesterday got her close to the top of the snow roof and to-day the weather being fine she was hauled out and found to be uninjured except a small split in one of her thwarts caused by the great weight she was now placed in a situation where there was no danger of her being again drifted over the eskimo left us on the seventeenth having behaved themselves in the most exemplary manner one of Akiulik's wives, quite a young dame with a most interesting squint, took this opportunity of leaving her husband and putting herself under the care of her father, Utu Uniak, the alleged cause of her dissatisfaction being that she did not get enough to eat. The disconsolate man followed the party for some distance in hopes of persuading the runaway to return, but without success. Our fuel getting rather scarce, some of the men were sent to dig among the snow for moss and heather and they usually got as much in a day as would cook one meal but as the spring advanced and the snow began to disappear two men could procure as much as we required when the men were taking a walk after divine service on the twenty first they saw traces of five deer going northward on the twenty second turner commenced making two sledges for our spring journeys they were to be from six to seven feet long seventeen inches broad and seven inches high the only wood we had for this purpose was the battens with which the inside of our boats was lined it being necessary to nail three of them together to form runners of the required height a wolf was shot by uligbuck during the night within ten yards of the door of the house and six or eight more were seen at no great distance off in the morning twenty third when taking my usual exercise I came upon a white owl feasting on a hare which it had killed after a severe struggle to judge by the marks in the snow half of it was already eaten another wolf was shot on the twenty fifth at a set gun but there was nothing of him to be found in the morning except a little hair and blood all the rest having been eaten or carried off by his companions some more deer tracks were seen going northward on the twenty sixth the height of beacon hill was found to be two hundred and thirty eight feet above the level of the sea at aft flood next day nibitabo saw thirty deer and ten partridges but only shot two of the latter the former were in the middle of a large plain and took good care to keep out of gunshot much to the annoyance of our deer hunter who is one of the keenest sportsmen i have ever met with there were two wolves wounded by uligbuck's gun last night one of which he caught before breakfast i went with him after the other in the forenoon and got sight of him about three miles from the house although his shoulder was fractured he gave us a long race before we ran him down but at last we saw that he had begun to eat snow a sure sign that he was getting fagged when i came up with him so tired was he that i was obliged to drive him on with the butt of my gun in order to get him nearer home before knocking him on the head at last we were unable to make him move on by any means we could employ 
ferocity and cowardice often if not always go together how different was the behaviour of this savage brute from that of the usually timid deer under similar circumstances the wolf crouched down and would not even look at us pull him about and use him as we might whereas i never saw a deer that did not attempt to defend itself when brought to bay however severely wounded it might be on the first march one of our sledges that had been finished was tried and found to answer well the deer were now steadily migrating northward some being seen every day but there were none killed until the eleventh when one was shot by nibitabo it proved to be a doe with young the fetus being about the size of a rabbit the sun had so much power that my blankets by being exposed to the air got completely dried being the first time they had been free from ice for three months shortly after divine service on the fourteenth akiulik who had gone some days before to his father-in-law's to endeavour to reclaim his better half returned with his lost treasure one of the most lazy and dirty of the whole party and a most errant thief to boot two deer were shot on the fifteenth and two more on the eighteenth deer hunting had become very different from what it was in the autumn the greater part of the hollows which favoured our approach in the latter season were now filled up with snow which from wasting away underneath made so much noise underfoot that in calm weather it was almost impossible to get within shot the deer were besides continually moving about in the most zigzag directions and were so much startled at the report of a gun that it was evident they had been a good deal hunted during the winter on the twentieth nibitabo was affected with inflammation of the eyes which was relieved by dropping laudanum into them on the twenty sixth we made a new water hole on the lake when the ice was found to be six feet ten inches thick i measured the dimensions of an eskimo canoe and found them as follows length twenty one feet breadth amidships nineteen inches and depth where the person sits nine and a half inches the timbers are one half or five eighths of an inch square and placed three inches apart near the centre of the canoe but gradually increased to five inches at each end the crossbars are three quarters of an inch thick and a foot from each other these were mortised into gunwales two and a half inches broad by half an inch thick the whole being covered with seal skin in the usual manner altogether it was much more neatly finished and lighter than any i had seen in hudson straits but the natives here have not attained the same dexterity in managing them as they cannot turn their canoes without assistance after being capsized on the thirty first uligbuck who had been absent all night came home at one p m very faint from the effects of a severe wound he had received on the arm by falling on a large dagger which he usually carried on cutting off his clothes i found the dagger had passed completely through the right arm a couple of inches above the elbow joint in the evening shimakuk who was a conjurer came in and as uligbuck wished to try the effect of his charms on the injured part i of course had no objections the whole process consisted in putting some questions the purport of which i could not learn to the patient in a very loud voice then muttering something in a very low tone and stopping occasionally to give two or three puffs of the breath on the wounded arm during these proceedings the men could with difficulty keep their gravity nor could i blame them for the scene was irresistibly ludicrous i observed that one of the conjurer's dogs was lame or rather very weak in the legs and on asking him the cause he said it arose from having eaten trout livers when young the latter part of the month of march was spent by the majority of the party in making preparations for our journey over the ice and snow to the northward it having been my intention to set out on first april but the accident to uligbuck prevented this as i did not wish to leave him until i saw his wound was in a fair way of healing ivitchuk our intended companion had not yet made his appearance on the third april the thermometer rose above zero for the first time since the twelfth december as the aurora was seldom noticed after this date i may here make a few remarks on this subject it was often visible during the winter and usually made its appearance first to the southward in the form of a faint yellow or straw-coloured arch which gradually rose up towards the zenith during our stay at fort hope i never witnessed a finer display of this strange phenomena than i had done at york factory nor did it on any occasion affect the horizontal needle as i had seen it do during the previous winter there 
the eskimo like the indians assert that the aurora produces a distinctly audible sound and the generality of orkneymen and zetlanders maintain the same opinion although for my own part i cannot say i ever heard any sound from it a fine display particularly if the movements are rapid is very often succeeded by stormy or snowy weather but i have never been able to trace any coincidence between the direction of its motions and that of the wind End of chapter 5chapter six of narrative of an expedition to the shores of the arctic sea in eighteen forty six and eighteen forty seven by john ray this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil schempf chapter six set out for the north equipment of the party snow blindness muskox mode of killing it reach the coast near point hargrave ice rough along shore Pass Cape Lady Pelly. Unfavorable weather. Slow progress. Put on short allowance. River Kitting Nuyak. Pemmican placed in cash. Cape Wainton. Colville Bay. High Hill. Dogs giving way. Work increased. Snow house building. Point Beaufort. Point Siver Wright. Keith Bay cape barclay another cache leave the coast and proceed across the land river amatuk dogs knocked up lake balendon harrison islands party left to procure provisions proceed with two of the men cape barrens relative effects of an eastern and western aspect helcott inlet reach lord mayor's bay Take formal possession of the country. Commence our return to winter quarters. Friendly interview with the natives. Obtain supplies of provisions from them. View of Pelly Bay. Trace the shore to the eastward. Travel by night. Explore the coasts of Simpson's Peninsula. Arrive at Fort Hope. Occurrences during the absence of the exploring party. Character of the Eskimo Ivitchuk everything having been for some days in readiness for our contemplated journey i only awaited the arrival of our eskimo ally ivitchuk he made his appearance on the fourth april in company with his wife his father and brother and their wives i could have well dispensed with the presence of the party excepting the man who was to go with us as there were many things to be attended to it is strange that throughout the winter with one or two exceptions the visits of these people have happened on sundays our intended travelling companion having received a coat from one inexpressibles from another leggings from a third etc was soon completely dressed a la voyageur not certainly to the improvement of the outer man but much to his own satisfaction ulig buck's arm now being in a fair way of recovery there was no cause of detention the party consisting besides myself of george flett john corrigal william adamson ulligbuck's son and ivitchuk started early on the morning of the fifth we were accompanied by two sledges each drawn by four dogs on which our luggage and provisions were stowed our stores consisted of three bags of pemmican seventy reindeer tongues one half hundred weight of flour some tea chocolate and sugar and a little alcohol and oil for fuel at first the weather was far from favorable for travelling as there was a gale of wind with snow but about eight a m the sky cleared up and the day became as fine as could have been wished the sun shone forth with great brightness surrounded by a halo of the most brilliant colors with four perhelia that rivalled the sun himself our route was the same as that followed in the boat last autumn but although the snow was hard packed and not rough our sledges were too heavy to allow us to travel quickly numerous bands of deer crossed our path and enlivened the scene at the same time that they kept up the spirit of our dogs our latitude at noon by an observation of the sun was sixty six degrees forty two minutes north variation of the compass sixty four degrees west between seven and eight p m both dogs and men being somewhat fatigued with their day's work we stopped on the east side of christie lake to build our snow hut 
which our eskimo friend was so long in completing on account of the bad state of the snow for building that it was eleven o'clock before we got into our blankets the situation of our encampment was in latitude sixty six degrees forty nine minutes thirty seconds north longitude eighty seven degrees twenty minutes west sixth we passed a comfortable night and it was six o'clock in the morning before we were again on the march three hours more brought us to the northern extremity of the lake where we had left a bag of flour and cash the previous autumn two men who had accompanied us for the purpose of taking the flour back to our winter quarters returned from this place a little before noon we arrived at the snow hut of the two eskimo shimakuk and keiiktuu who with their families had been staying some time here angling trout i had agreed with those people that they should build a large snow house for our accommodation having expected to reach them at the end of our first day's journey in this we were disappointed but as the contracting party had prepared a fine rooming dwelling for us they received the stipulated price a clasp knife at noon when still on the lake the latitude sixty six degrees fifty eight minutes sixteen seconds north was observed keiiktuu having come with us for a short distance i proposed that he should get his sledge and dogs and accompany us for two days this for a dagger as a consideration he gladly agreed to do and immediately went off at a great rate to bring up his team being quite light he soon overtook us and was not long in getting a heavy load on i soon saw the advantage of his iced runners over the iron ones and determined to have ours done in the same way on the first opportunity on this account we stopped sooner than we would otherwise have done having travelled sixteen geographical miles we found a number of old eskimo houses one of which we prepared for our use by clearing out the snow that had drifted into it whilst the two eskimo were icing the sledges the remainder of the men were cooking and preparing our bed the latter being a very simple process merely requiring the snow to be well smoothed and one or two hairy deer skins laid over it to prevent the heat of the body from thawing the snow the weather was fair all day and except in the morning when the thermometer was minus sixteen degrees it was rather warm for walking after we got into our lodgings a strong breeze sprung up with thick drift some of the party were slightly affected with snow blindness seventh the weather was gloomy and dark this morning with a thermometer at plus five degrees when we started at half past three our sledges ran much easier since they had received a coating of ice on their runners although they were not yet equal to keiiktuus we followed the same route as that taken by the boat last autumn until nine o'clock when being two miles from the sea we struck across land towards port hargrave at noon we were in latitude sixty seven degrees sixteen minutes fifty one seconds north variation of the compass seventy four degrees thirty minutes west we found the snow much softer than it was on the lakes and river and our progress was consequently much slower than in the first part of the day at two p m we arrived at a small lake about four miles from point hargrave as this was the only fresh-water lake we were likely to meet with for some time i determined to stop for the purpose of renewing the icing on the sledges which had been a good deal broken by the irregularities of the road notwithstanding that we had gone only eighteen miles our dogs were very tired and i began to fear that they would not hold out so well as was expected our eskimo friend was to leave us the next day and as his sledge was light he expected to reach his house the same day this is a favorite resort of the muskox as soon as the snow disappears the mode of killing these animals is the same as that described by sir j c ross as practised in boothia felix by the eskimo being brought to bay with dogs they are either shot with arrows or speared when we resumed our journey at five o'clock next morning there was a strong breeze right ahead with thick drift the temperature being six degrees a walk of three miles brought us to the coast about a mile from point hargrave there was a great deal of rough ice along the shore which gave both men and dogs much hard work to drag the sledges over it had now begun to snow and the drift was so thick that we could not follow the smoothest route we consequently advanced but slowly taking four hours to gain five and a half miles which brought us to cape lady pelly since leaving fort hope 
i had measured every foot of the ground we had passed over with a line but now the increased difficulty of the route made it requisite that all hands should be employed in dragging the sledges one of our best dogs became quite useless and although unharnessed would not walk so that rather than lose the poor animal we dragged him on the snow several miles before reaching our intended encampment after passing cape lady pelly the coast turns rather more to the westward the weather continued very unfavorable all day there being much snow drift we however advanced seven miles farther and at four p m built our night's lodging on the ice a few hundred yards from the shore in an hour and a half we were comfortably housed finding that our day's journeys were much shorter than i had anticipated our allowance of food for supper was somewhat reduced the thermometer in the evening stood at plus eleven degrees our snow hut was situated in latitude sixty seven degrees thirty five minutes north longitude eighty seven degrees fifty one minutes west both by account after a sound night's rest we resumed our journey at five in the morning of the ninth there was some snow falling but the wind had decreased and the temperature of the air was plus two degrees our course was northwest by west for three miles when we came to a low point formed of shingle and mud with some rocky rising grounds a few miles inland this point received the name of swanston after a friend a short time before noon the sky cleared and very satisfactory observations for latitude and variation of the compass were obtained the former being sixty seven degrees forty minutes fifty three seconds north the latter seventy one degrees thirty minutes west the dog that had been unharnessed the day before had become still weaker and as i did not wish to leave him to the mercy of the wolves he was shot we offered some of his flesh to the other dogs but there was only one of them that would eat it having walked fourteen miles we arrived at a small river seventy yards wide and although it was only half past three we commenced building our snow house we here found a number of stones which allowed us to place in cash half a bag of pemmican some flour shoes etc for our homeward journey the river which is called kitingnuyak was frozen to the bottom but in summer it is a favorable fishing station both salmon and small species of the white fish being found i did not see any of the latter but from the description given by the eskimo i have no doubt that they frequent this part of the coast the evening was beautifully clear and the thermometer fell to minus sixteen degrees tenth there was a thick haze this morning with light variable airs of wind temperature six degrees below zero by striking straight out from land for a mile or two we got upon somewhat smoother ice and consequently made more progress we passed a number of hills not of any great elevation however and at noon we were opposite one named weachat fully five hundred feet high and some miles from the coast here the latitude sixty seven degrees fifty three minutes twenty four seconds was observed the coast turned off to the westward forming a point which we named cape wainton we now commenced crossing a bay five or six miles deep and apparently twelve wide which received the name of colville in honor of the deputy governor of the hudson's bay company a mouse or lemming crossed our path and the dogs although they appeared to be scarcely able to put one foot before another set off at full speed in chase and before any one could interfere to save it the poor little animal was quivering in the jaws of the foremost being unable to reach the north side of colville bay at four p m we took up our quarters on the ice in our usual snug lodgings in latitude sixty eight degrees two minutes north longitude eighty eight degrees twenty one minutes west a high hill bearing west of us and distant eight miles called umiwiak by the natives was named after the late john george mctavish esq chief factor several of our dogs had become very weak so much so that during the latter part of the day's journey they did little or nothing thus giving us all much additional work they also required much more food to keep them in good condition than the dogs generally used in the fur countries we only walked sixteen miles this day and i may here remark that all the distances mentioned in this journal are given in geographical miles our usual mode of preparing lodgings for the night was as follows as soon as we had selected a spot for our snow house our eskimo assisted by one or more of the men commenced cutting out blocks of snow 
when a sufficient number of these had been raised the builder commenced his work his assistants supplying him with the material a good roomy dwelling was thus raised in an hour if the snow was in good state for building whilst our principal mason was thus occupied another of the party was busy erecting a kitchen which although our cooking was none of the most delicate or extensive was still a necessary addition to our establishment had it been only to thaw snow as soon as the snow hut was completed our sledges were unloaded and everything edible including parchment skin and moose skin shoes which had now become favorite articles with the dogs taken inside our bed was next made and by the time the snow was thawed or the water boiled as the case may be we were all ready for supper when we used alcohol for fuel as we usually did in stormy weather no kitchen was required on the following morning we started about the usual hour and directing our course nearly north a walk of five miles brought us to the opposite side of colville bay which terminated in a long point covered with boulders of granite and debris of limestone and having a number of stone marks set up on it to this point the name of beaufort was given in honor of the gallant officer who with so much advantage to his country and to nautical science presides over the hydrographical department of the admiralty five miles farther we reached another low point called by the eskimo etuyuk but renamed by me point Siverite. the coast now turning slightly to the westward of north continued in nearly a straight line during the rest of this day's march we were now tracing the shores of a considerable bay as the land after taking a sudden bend to the eastward followed a southeast direction as far as visible at four p m we stopped and built our snow hut the day had been fine throughout and the temperature in the evening was sixteen degrees below zero the shores of the bay are very low with the exception of a high bluff point bearing southeast by east six and a half miles by trigonometrical measurement the point was named cape barclay in honor of the secretary of the hudson's bay company and the bay was called after my much respected friend george keith esq chief factor since passing colville bay the coast had become much lower and more level giving every indication of a limestone country being anxious to save our fuel as much as possible we filled two small kettles and a bladder with snow and took them to bed with us for the purpose of procuring water to drink a plan which was frequently adopted afterwards our dogs had now become most ravenous although they received what was considered a fair allowance of provisions everything that came in their way such as shoes leather mitts and even a worsted belt was eaten much to the annoyance of the owners and to the merriment of the rest of the party we enjoyed a cold supper of pemmican and water as we could afford a hot meal only once a day we preferred taking it in the morning twelfth being informed by our eskimo companion that by crossing over land in a northwest direction to a large bay which he had formerly visited we should shorten our distance considerably i determined on adopting the plan proposed our kettles of snow were found rather cool companions but there was a little water formed the bladder having been either leaky or not properly tied gave me and my next neighbor a partial cold bath the morning was delightful being clear and calm with a temperature of minus twenty two degrees we started at half past five and after having walked a short distance came to some loose pieces of granite and limestone which afforded an opportunity not to be lost for making a deposit of provisions for our return journey after tracing the shores of the bay for three miles and a half further north to latitude sixty eight degrees eighteen minutes north longitude by account eighty eight degrees twenty six minutes west we left the coast and proceeded overland in a north northwest direction walking became more difficult and the snow was too soft to support the sledges the ice on the runners of which was now entirely worn off a mile's walk brought us to a small river with high mud banks and frozen to the bottom it was named amatuk by the natives and takes its rise from a lake of the same name about a day's journey west of us we next passed between two elevations covered with limestone i ascended that on the right hand or to the east of us it being the highest and having two columns of limestone the one fourteen the other nine feet high at its western extremity 
there were many places here denuded of snow showing that the sun had already acquired great power at noon we were in latitude sixty eight degrees twenty two minutes nineteen seconds north variation of the compass seventy nine degrees thirty five minutes west an hour after we reached a small lake where we halted on account of our dogs being quite knocked up although we had only advanced twelve miles i therefore ordered a hut to be built that we might afford the dogs time to recruit and also have the sledge runners put in order we found the ice on the lake four feet eight inches thick but we were disappointed to find that there were no fish to be caught we here enjoyed water ad libitum a luxury that had been rather sparingly dealt out for the last few days Ivitchuk drank as much as would have satisfied an ox the thermometer in the evening was nine degrees below zero a few tracks of foxes were here seen but no sign of deer or musk oxen this part of the country appeared miserably barren in every respect on the morning of the thirteenth we commenced our march at two thirty a m the weather was fine with light airs from the northwest thermometer minus fifteen degrees at five o'clock we passed a small lake about a mile and a half long and an hour afterwards reached another of considerable size Tungalik, as the lake is called by the Eskimo, is seven miles long, due north and south, and varying in breadth from a mile to a mile and a half. Near its center was a curious-looking island, about seven feet high and two hundred yards in extent, covered with granite boulders and limestone. Its form is as nearly as possible that of a semicircle, the concavity being towards the south. To this lake I gave the name of Bolinden, after a much-valued friend when near the north end of Bolinden lake over which we had travelled rapidly the snow being both hard and smooth we turned more to the west at noon we arrived at a lake which was to be our resting place for the night as although small it was said to contain both trout and salmon but after cutting through five feet of ice we did not succeed in catching any although we tempted them with a bait from a buffalo hide in the afternoon the weather became very gloomy a strong breeze sprang up accompanied by a thick haze and the thermometer rose to minus eleven degrees by meridian observation our latitude was sixty eight degrees thirty six minutes fifty eight seconds north variation of the compass seventy eight degrees west longitude by account eighty eight degrees forty nine minutes west fourteenth this morning was so stormy with thick drift and snow that we could not start so early as usual it however became more moderate at five o'clock and we were able to continue our route although the guide seemed much puzzled to keep in the proper direction there being nothing to serve as marks in this wilderness of snow in the afternoon the weather again became worse and the temperature fell to minus twelve degrees which with a strong headwind made it sufficiently cold I felt it probably more than the others, as I had to stop often to take bearings, and in consequence was once or twice nearly losing the party altogether. We trudged on manfully until 5 p.m., when it cleared up for two or three minutes, and we obtained a distant glimpse of some high islands in the bay for which we were bound, called Akuliguiak by the natives. At half past five, we commenced building our snow house. This was far from pleasant work as the wind was piercingly cold and the fine particles of snowdrift penetrated our clothes everywhere we however enjoyed ourselves the more when we got under shelter and took our supper of the staple commodities pemmican and water latitude sixty eight degrees fifty one minutes north longitude eighty nine degrees sixteen minutes west fifteenth it blew a complete storm all night but we were as snug and comfortable in our snow hive as if we had been lodged in the best house in england at five thirty the wind moderated to a gale but the drift was still so thick that it was impossible to see any distance before us particularly when looking to windward and that unfortunately was the direction in which we had to go the temperature was twenty one degrees below zero a temperature which as all arctic travellers know feels much colder when there is a breeze of wind than one of minus sixty degrees or minus seventy degrees when the weather is calm but there was the prospect of both food and fuel before us for seals were said to abound in the bay and heather on the islands of akuliguiak 
such temptations were not to be resisted so we muffled ourselves well up and set out it was one of the worst days i have ever travelled in and i could not take the bearings of our route more than once or twice to make matters worse one of our dogs a fine lively little creature that was a great favourite with us all became unable to walk unharnessed and the men having enough to do with the sledges i dragged carried and coaxed it on for a few miles but finding that some parts of my face were freezing and that my companions were so far ahead as to be out of sight i was reluctantly compelled to leave the poor animal to its fate after a most devious course of nearly twelve miles we came to the shores of the bay the banks were of mud and shingle about sixty or seventy feet high and so steep that it was some time before we could find a place by which to get down to the ice we directed our steps among much rough ice towards the highest of the group of islands named koga urgawiak apparently six miles distant and encamped near its western end in a little well-sheltered bay all the party even the eskimo had got severely frost-bitten in the face but as it was not much more than skin deep this gave us little concern when our house was nearly built a search was commenced among the snow for heather and we were so fortunate as to procure enough in an hour and a half to cook us some pemmican and flour in the form of a kind of soup or pottage we were all very glad to get into our blankets as soon as possible the weather became somewhat finer in the evening but it drifted as much as ever the thermometer was minus sixteen degrees our latitude was sixty eight degrees fifty three minutes forty four seconds north longitude eighty nine degrees fifty five minutes thirty seconds west notwithstanding that i carried my watch next to my skin the cold stopped it and i could not tell exactly the time of our arrival at the island but i believed it was near two p m on the sixteenth a gale of wind from the northwest with thick drift and the thermometer at minus twenty degrees would have prevented our travelling had i intended it but as i proposed leaving some of the men and all the dogs here to recruit i wished to find out the eskimo who we knew were in the neighbourhood as the recent foot tracks of two had been seen on the shore the day before and obtain from them some seal's flesh and blubber for our use flett ivitchuk and the interpreter were sent on this mission but they returned in the evening unsuccessful the drift was so thick in the bay that they could not see to any distance in the meantime corrigal and adamson had been collecting fuel and i being under the lee of the island obtained observations for latitude and variation of the compass the former being sixty eight degrees fifty three minutes forty four seconds north as above the latter eighty seven degrees forty minutes west i prepared for an early start the next morning in company with flett and corrigal for the purpose if possible of reaching sir john ross's most southerly discoveries which could not now be distant more than two days journey the party that were to be left behind had orders to kill seals for which purpose ivitchuk was furnished with a spear to trade provisions from the eskimo if they saw any and above all to use as little of our present stock as possible all that we could afford to take with us was four days scanty allowance i had for the last week carried my instruments books etc in all about thirty-five pounds weight and i now intended to do the same the morning of the seventeenth was stormy and cold minus twenty-two degrees and we did not start until near six o'clock when we had got well clear of the southwest end of the island we found the ice smooth and the snow on it hard packed as the men had but a light load we travelled fast our course being nearly northwest towards the farthest visible land in that direction a brisk walk of seventeen miles brought us an hour before noon to the shore near a high point formed of dark grey granite which i named cape barrens after one of the directors of the company it is situated in latitude sixty nine degrees four minutes twelve seconds north by observation and longitude ninety degrees thirty five minutes forty eight seconds west by account the shore which was steep and rocky ran nearly in a straight line and in the same direction that we had been already travelling at three p m we came to two narrow points in a small bay between which we built our snow-house to these points i gave the name of the twins 
their latitude is sixty nine degrees thirteen minutes fourteen seconds north longitude ninety degrees fifty five minutes thirty seconds west there being one or two hills at a short distance from us i ascended one of them to look for fuel and to gain a view of our future route i obtained neither of these objects but fell in with some lead ore specimens of which were brought away on arriving at the snow hut i found it nearly completed but so small that there was little prospect of a comfortable night's rest having but a very small quantity of alcohol for fuel our supper was a cold one thermometer in the evening nineteen degrees below zero flett one of deason simpson's best men showed symptoms of fatigue at which i was much surprised as from what i had heard of him i fancied he would have tired out any of the party eighteenth my anticipations of passing an uncomfortable night were fully realized it might be thought that as our whole bedding consisted of one blanket and a hairy deerskin to put between us and the snow there was reason enough for my not sleeping soundly but this was not the case as i often passed nights both before and after this with as little covering but never found myself cold we started at three a m the morning was fine but hazy with a light air of wind from the northwest thermometer minus three degrees the walking was still fair and i may here remark that wherever the land had an eastern exposure the ice was smooth there being little or none of the former year forced up along the shore whenever the coast was exposed to the west the contrary was the case our course was nearly that of the previous day but a little more to the westward after walking twelve miles we came to what proved to be the head of a deep inlet the western shore of which we had been tracing and which i named after john halkett esq one of the directors of the hudson's bay company whose son lieutenant p a halkett royal navy is the ingenious inventor of the portable air-boat which ought to be the travelling companion of every explorer two reindeer were seen here as there could be no doubt that if my longitude was correct i must now be near the lord mayor's bay of sir john ross i decided on striking across land as nearly north as possible instead of following the coast the men having a short time to rest we commenced a tiresome march over land the snow being in some places both deep and soft we crossed three small lakes and at noon when near the middle of another about four miles long an excellent meridian observation of the sun gave latitude sixty nine degrees twenty six minutes one second north when we had walked three miles more we came to another small lake and here as there was yet no appearance of the sea i ordered my men to prepare our lodgings whilst i went on alone to endeavour to discover the coast a walk of twenty minutes brought me to an inlet not more than a quarter of a mile wide this i traced to the westward for upwards of a league when my course was again obstructed by land there were some high rocks near at hand which i ascended and from the summit i thought i could distinguish rough ice in the desired direction with renewed hopes i slid down a declivity plunging among snow scrambling over rocks and through rough ice until i gained more level ground i then directed my steps to some rising ground which i found to be close to the seashore from the spot on which i now stood as far as the eye could reach to the northwestward lay a large extent of ice-covered sea studded with innumerable islands lord mayor's bay was before me and the islands were those named by sir john ross the sons of the clergy of the church of scotland the isthmus which connects the land to the north with the continent is only one mile broad and even in this short space there are three small ponds from the great number of stone marks set up the only ones that i saw on this part of the coast i am led to infer that this is a deer pass in the autumn and consequently a favorite resort of the natives its latitude is sixty nine degrees thirty one minutes north longitude by account ninety one degrees twenty nine minutes thirty seconds west this latter differs only a mile or two from that of the same place as laid down by sir james c ross with whose name i distinguish the isthmus calling the land to the northward sir john ross's peninsula after going down to the ice in hardy bay and offering with a humble and grateful heart 
thanks to him who had thus brought our journey so far to a successful termination i began to retrace my steps towards my companions at a late hour i reached our snow hut an excellent roomy one in which we could lie in any position no trifling comfort after a walk of more than forty miles over a rough road it was seven o'clock the following morning before we started the weather was pleasant and the thermometer twelve degrees below zero having taken possession of our discoveries with the usual formalities we traced the inlet eastward the shores of which were steep and rugged in some places precipitous when we had walked four miles the land on our left turned up to the northward leaving an opening in that direction more than two miles wide bounded on the southeast by one or more islands this inlet i named after that celebrated navigator and discoverer sir john franklin whose protracted absence in the arctic sea is at present exciting so much interest and anxiety throughout england the most distant visible point was called cape thomas after a relative the land at our right still trended to the east for two miles and then turned to the south after walking seven miles in this last direction and passing two small bays and as many points we stopped for the night here we were fairly puzzled about the proper route there being so many inlets and small bays that it was impossible to tell which was the one we ought to follow the day had become very warm the thermometer rising as high as plus twenty six degrees in the sun and as we were now travelling south we found the reflection from the snow much more painful to the eyes than when proceeding north the latitude of our snow house was sixty nine degrees twenty two minutes north longitude ninety one degrees three minutes west both by account the thermometer minus nineteen degrees in the evening cold water and pemmican for supper and kettles of snow for bedfellows the morning of the twentieth was cold but calm thermometer minus twenty four degrees we commenced our day's march at two hours thirty minutes a m and in twenty minutes arrived at the head of the inlet where i hoped to find a passage seeing that it would be madness to trace all the indentations of this most irregular coast for had a couple of days stormy weather ensued we should all have run the risk of starving i struck overland towards our snow hut of the seventeenth this was the most fatiguing and at the same time the most ludicrous march we had experienced as our route lay across several ranges of hills we had no sooner climbed up one side than we had to slide down the other to descend was not always an easy matter as there were often large stones in the way past which we required to steer with great care or if a collision was unavoidable to manage so as not to injure ourselves corrigal appeared to be an old hand at this sort of work and i had some practice but poor flett who had begun to suffer much from inflammation of the eyes got many queer falls and was once or twice placed in such situations with his head downhill his heels up and the strap of his bundle round his neck that it would have been impossible for him to get up by his own unaided exertions after crossing a number of small lakes we arrived at the steep shores of halkett inlet about eleven o'clock having been eight hours in walking as many miles we crossed the inlet and as it had now begun to blow a fresh breeze we stopped at a small bay well sheltered to take some rest and obtain a meridian observation of the sun the latitude was sixty nine degrees sixteen minutes forty four seconds north variation of the compass seventy six degrees forty five minutes west we were so fortunate as to find here some heather by scraping away the snow and we enjoyed the luxury of a cup of chocolate which refreshed us very much we now resumed our march and the walking being good and the day fine we made rapid progress although somewhat detained by the lameness and blindness of flett who stumbled at every inequality of the ground and received some severe falls after advancing two miles we came opposite to a clear opening to the northeastward in which nothing but rough ice could be seen this was evidently the termination of the continent in this direction at four p m we arrived at our snow hut in the small bay between the twins it was not my intention to remain here all night but the lameness of our companion prevented us from continuing our journey whilst i went to search for fuel corrigal enlarged our snow house 
i found a little fuel with which we contrived to thaw as much snow as gave each of us nearly half a pint of water the remainder of our provisions amounting to a few ounces of pemmican each was fairly divided and having eaten part of this we betook ourselves to rest twenty first having passed a far from pleasant night and used the last of our alcohol to procure some water as a dilutant for our not very plentiful breakfast we started at a little before two a m there was a strong breeze from the northwest with thick drift occasionally and a temperature of minus twenty degrees but the wind being on our backs it was rather an advantage than otherwise we directed our course straight for the island on which we had left the rest of the party and which could be seen at intervals when the snow drift cleared away flett being still very lame i desired corrigal to remain in company with him whilst i went on alone to order some provisions to be prepared by the time they came to the snow house the ice being smooth and the snow on its surface hard i made rapid progress until within about five miles of our temporary home here i observed some strange-looking figures on the ice which the thickness of the weather prevented me from seeing distinctly on a nearer approach i found that what had puzzled me was a number of eskimo spears lances etc stuck on a heap of snow and immediately afterwards four eskimo came from behind a mound of ice holding up their hands to show that they were unarmed the natives of this part of the coast bear a very bad character and are much feared by their countrymen of repulse bay i therefore was not quite sure what sort of reception i might meet with as my men were not in sight and i was quite unarmed but to anticipate evil is often the most likely way to cause it so i went directly up and saluted them with their usual term for peace tema shaking hands with all after the fashion of our own country they all shouted out maneg tomig which are the words mentioned by sir john ross as the form of salutation employed by the natives of boothia felix a very animated conversation soon ensued in which i bore but a very small share but as i appeared to be a good listener and put in a negative or affirmative every now and then when there appeared to be a necessity for saying something we got on very well together we were soon joined by an old woman who took upon herself the office of mistress of the ceremonies and commenced with great volubility to give me the names of the men which were as follows alaniayuk kogvig tognaku and nuliayuk the first being old the second middle-aged and the two last young men about twenty-five they were all married and were much more forward in their manners and dirty in their persons and dress than our friends of repulse bay they were very anxious for me to enter their huts but this i thought it prudent to decline and after much persuasion and promise of knives needles beads etc i prevailed on them to follow me to our snow-house a little more than an hour brought me to our encampment where i found adamson quite well but all alone ivitchuk and the boy being out looking for seals they had not met with any eskimo and no animals of any kind had been killed ivitchuk standing so much in awe of his countrymen that he was afraid to stay out seal hunting during the night which is the only time that these animals are to be caught at that season of the year i found that much more of our stock of provisions had been used than there was any occasion for in fact the appearance of the men showed that they had been on full allowance about an hour after my arrival corrigal and flett made their appearance accompanied by the four eskimo that i had seen and a boy a few trifling presents were made them and they promised to return on the following day with oil blubber etc to barter with us it blew a gale all evening with the thermometer twenty one degrees below zero the morning of the twenty second was fine with a temperature of minus twenty degrees but during the day it blew hard with drift our party kept in bed rather longer than usual and we were visited by the eskimo before we had got up they brought a quantity of seal's flesh blood and blubber which i was about to purchase from them when the thermometer was reported as missing i immediately shut the box containing the valuables and intimated that they should receive nothing unless the thermometer was given up after about ten minutes delay one of the women brought in the lost article saying that the dogs had pulled it down and carried it off a very probable story certainly but having obtained what i wanted i cared little who might be the thief 
a brisk traffic was soon commenced for oil seals blubber flesh and blood for which knives files beads needles etc were given we also obtained half a dozen dried salmon and a small piece of dried muskox flesh both very old and mouldy these eskimo were found to be much more difficult to deal with than our friends of repulse bay being very forward and much addicted to stealing they had undoubtedly had communication with the natives of boothia felix as there were many of their weapons and parts of their sledges formed of oak i also observed some small pieces of mahogany among them one of the strangers proved to be an uncle of ivitchuk it continued to blow hard in the evening with a temperature of minus fifteen degrees preparations were made for examining the shores of the bay in which by eskimo report we now were twenty third this was another stormy and cold day until the afternoon when it became fair we were again visited by our neighbors who brought us a further and very acceptable supply of seals flesh and blood and also two fine dogs to complete our teams one or two of those we had being still very weak when about to make a tour round the bay i learnt from one of the natives that a complete view of its shores could be obtained from the summit of the island on which we were i found also that a chart which he made of the bay agreed very closely with one drawn by the natives of repulse bay who had visited the place the evening being beautifully clear i took with me the eskimo one of the men and the interpreter to the highest point of the island from which i obtained a distinct view of the whole bay except a small portion immediately under the sun the shores were high and regular in their outline and being in most places to a certain extent denuded of snow they were much more clearly seen than could have been expected the bay appeared to extend sixteen or eighteen miles slightly to the east of south and was about eleven miles wide near its head its surface was studded with a number of dark-coloured rocky islands the highest of these was the one on which we were staying and was found by measurement to be seven hundred thirty feet above the level of the sea it was called helen island whilst the group to which it belonged was named after benjamin harrison esq one of the directors of the hudson's bay company the eskimo pointed out the direction in which two rivers near the head of the bay lay these rivers of which i took the bearings by compass were said to be of no great size and frozen to the bottom in winter the bay was honoured with the name of sir john h pelly baronet governor of the company the morning of the twenty fourth was as beautiful as could be desired with a thermometer at minus fifteen degrees there was a gentle air from the east and the horizon being very clear i again obtained a fine view of the bay having abundance of blubber for dogs meat and fuel and as much seals flesh and blood for ourselves as at half allowance would serve us for six or seven days i determined to trace the shores of the land across which we had travelled on our outward journey for this purpose both men and dogs being now much recruited we started at eight hours thirty minutes a m and took a northeast by east course towards the eastern shore of the bay which having a western exposure was much encumbered with rough ice we had some trouble in getting over this but found it more smooth along the shore which trended due north finding that our sledges were too heavily laden we left on the ice a quantity of our oil and blubber here we made a mistake in retaining the fresh fat of the seal instead of that which had become somewhat rancid as we found that although the dogs ate the latter with avidity they would scarcely taste the former this ivitchuk knew well but he was too stupid to tell me of it at the time one of our dogs that had done his work well since leaving repulse bay had become so weak that he could scarcely walk we endeavoured to coax him on but unsuccessfully it was therefore thought advisable to leave him where we had lightened our load as he would have provisions for at least a fortnight if not assisted by other animals and before that time he would very likely be found by the eskimo a meridian observation gave latitude sixty eight degrees fifty minutes forty six seconds north variation seventy eight degrees fifty six minutes west as the sun had acquired too much power for travelling comfortably during the daytime i stopped early so as to be able to continue our journey about midnight our snow hut was built near a small creek 
in latitude sixty eight degrees fifty eight minutes north longitude eighty nine degrees forty two minutes west the coast had become low and flat with a few fragments of limestone and granite boulders showing themselves occasionally above the snow the thermometer exposed to the sun's rays rose to plus thirty seven degrees a little snow fell in the evening on the morning of the twenty fifth there was some more snow with a temperature of minus seven degrees we did not commence our march until some hours later than i had expected the direction of the land continued nearly north for eight miles it then turned off to the northeast and continued so until we stopped at noon in latitude by observation sixty nine degrees fourteen minutes thirty seven seconds north longitude by account eighty nine degrees eighteen minutes eighteen seconds west the tracks of a large polar bear and of some lemmings were noticed this day twenty sixth the morning was dark and cloudy when we started at twenty minutes after one when just about to set out we were joined by the poor dog we had left behind he had grown into much better condition although he was still unable to haul i may here add that he afterwards quite recovered and was the only one of our stock that i took to england with me our course for seven miles was east and then turned off southeast by south forming a cape which was named chapman after one of the directors of the hudson's bay company we continued walking on in nearly a straight line for eleven miles when our dogs became tired and we encamped an hour before noon in latitude by observation sixty nine degrees five minutes thirty five seconds north variation eighty one degrees fifty minutes west longitude by account eighty eight degrees forty three minutes west at eleven p m we recommenced our march the weather being beautiful and the temperature minus eight degrees twenty seventh the coast trended in exactly the same direction as that we had passed during the latter part of the preceding day's journey the walking was in general good and our dogs were every day recovering their strength a single rock grouse tetrao rupestris was seen but so shy that we could not get a shot at it many traces of foxes and the recent footmarks of a large white bear were also seen we kept a sharp lookout for the latter with the hopes of getting a few stakes out of him but he did not show himself there was a high wall of broken ice all along the shore here which may be readily accounted for by the direction of the coast which by contracting the bay is exposed to the pressure of the ice coming from the northward fortunate it was for us that we had got some oil and seals blubber for there was not a bit of anything in the shape of fuel to be seen along this barren shore the weather having become too warm about eleven a m we stopped in latitude by observation sixty eight degrees fifty one minutes north longitude by account eighty eight degrees six minutes west the morning of the twenty eighth was particularly fine with a temperature of fifteen degrees below zero for eight miles our course was the same as that of the day before but the land now turned gradually to the southward and finally to about a south by west direction at noon the sun had become so warm that we were compelled to encamp for the day at three miles from where we had stopped we passed a small bay about one and one half mile wide the only indentation of the coast we had seen since leaving pelly bay our latitude by meridian observation was sixty eight degrees thirty two minutes forty seconds north variation of the compass seventy degrees fifty five minutes west and our longitude by account eighty eight degrees two minutes west twenty ninth we resumed our march at a little after eleven p m on the twenty eighth the weather was calm but cloudy with a temperature of minus three degrees the line of the coast now ran nearly south and after a walk of five miles we came to a narrow point extending two miles to the eastward we then crossed the bay about one and one-half mile wide and arrived at another point of nearly the same dimensions both formed of mud and shingle these i named respectively after james and robert clouston two intimate friends four miles further brought us opposite to a small low island half a mile from the shore and at a short distance beyond this we came to a small bay upwards of a mile wide a little before noon we stopped to build our snow hut 
the day was now warm the thermometer having risen as high as plus fifty five degrees in the sun and plus eighteen in the shade one of our best dogs got lamed by putting his foot into a crack in the ice we saw the smoke of open water at no great distance and heard the ice making a loud noise as it was driven along with the tide there were numerous traces of foxes and the tracks of a band of deer with a wolverine in pursuit were noticed the latitude of our position was sixty eight degrees fifteen minutes north variation seventy five degrees fifty two minutes west and longitude by account eighty eight degrees five minutes thirty eight seconds west thirtieth we started at half past nine the previous night with clear weather and a fresh breeze from the west which with a temperature of minus eight degrees made our already frost-bitten faces smart severely after a few miles walk we rounded a low spit of land which had been hid from our view by the rough ice on our outward journey and which i now named point anderson between this point and cape barclay of which we now got sight there was a narrow bay running up to the northward two or three miles we had a great quantity of rough ice to scramble over which however fatiguing afforded some amusement as the ridiculous positions in which we were sometimes placed gave abundant food for mirth to those who were disposed to look at everything in the most favourable light about midnight the weather became very stormy so much so that we had great difficulty in keeping the proper course which was now to the northwest for the purpose of picking up the pemmican etc which we had deposited on the shore of keith bay on the twelfth on reaching the west side of the bay at three a m i found that we were not more than a hundred yards from where our cache was placed which we found quite safe ivitchuk and the boy having lagged behind we removed a quantity of snow and took possession of our old snow hut to wait for them after staying for an hour we resumed our journey thinking that our companions might have taken a shorter route across the bay and this we found to be the case it had been cold and stormy during the greater part of the night but at eight hours thirty minutes a m when we were encamped opposite cape beaufort the weather had become beautiful the whole of the coast which we had traced during the last seven days as far as cape barclay was low and flat with neither rock nor hill to interrupt the sameness of the landscape it was named simpson's peninsula after sir george simpson the able and enterprising governor of the hudson's bay company's territories who projected and planned the expedition and to whose zeal in the cause of discovery arctic travellers have been so often and so much indebted during the remainder of our journey homewards having followed as nearly as possible our outward route we met with little of any interest we reached our encampment of the ninth of april on the first of may and found our cache of provisions quite safe we had now an abundant stock of food nor were we sorry to exchange the seal's flesh and blood on which we had been subsisting for eight days past for pemmican and flour it is true that during that time we had supped on a few dried salmon which were so old and mouldy that the water in which they were boiled became quite green such however is the advantage of hard work and short commons that we enjoyed that change of food as much as if it had been one of the greatest delicacies both the salmon and the water in which they were cooked were used to the last morsel and drop although i firmly believe that a moderately well-fed dog would not have tasted either we now saw numerous tracks of reindeer all proceeding in a northeast direction towards melville peninsula early on the morning of the third of may we arrived at the small lake near point hargrave on which we had encamped on the seventh of april much of the snow had disappeared from the ground in the neighbourhood and the marmots had already cleared out the entrances to their burrows and recommenced their life of activity for the summer season not an hour now passed without our seeing deer but they were extremely shy and the only benefit we received from them was the life and spirit of their presence infused into our dogs the night of the fourth was very unpleasant there being much snow and drift which prevented us from seeing the ridges of snow which occurred frequently on our path and which being very hard and slippery caused us many falls at half past one on the morning of the fifth we reached some old eskimo dwellings on the border of christie lake about fifteen miles from fort hope in one of which we took up our temporary abode 
at two p m on the same day we were again on the march and arrived at our home at eight hours thirty minutes p m all well but so black and scarred on the face from the combined effects of oil smoke and frost-bites that our friends would not believe but that some serious accident from the explosion of gunpowder had happened to us thus successfully terminated a journey a little short of six hundred english miles the longest i believe ever made on foot along the arctic coast during our absence everything had gone on prosperously at winter quarters the people had all been in good health and the wound in uligbuck's arm had healed up but the limb had not yet acquired much strength when i set out on the fifth of april there was but a very small quantity of venison in store so that i was afraid that folster the man left in charge would be forced to use pemmican which substantial article i wished to save as much as possible for future contingencies fortunately the eskimo brought a little venison to barter which with an occasional deer killed by the hunters kept the party in food although the store at one time was so empty that they were compelled to have a dinner of tongues which except in the case of necessity were to be kept for journeys as the weather in the latter part of april became stormy and the deer numerous the hunters were more successful and there was no further scarcity uligbuck had notwithstanding the wound in his arm killed four deer and sixteen more had been shot by nibitabo and some others of the party so that the meat store was well stocked when i arrived and well that it was so for we were as ravenous as wolves and i believe ate more than would have been good for us had our food been anything but venison which is so digestible that a person may eat almost any quantity without feeling any bad effects from it may commenced with a beautiful day the thermometer being above zero and continuing so throughout this was the only day for many months past that the negative scale of the thermometer had not been registered on the third snowbirds were seen and marmots had some time before emerged from their winter quarters the eskimo with the exception of one or two families had built their snow huts within a quarter of a mile of our house where they had been living for more than a week they had almost all behaved well and were commended accordingly they had not yet commenced seal hunting but were to do so as soon as the seals came up on the ice in the meantime they were catching deer and snow traps made by digging holes in the snow and covering them with thin slabs of the same material wolves are often taken in a similar manner but for them the hole requires to be not less than eight or nine feet deep and after it is covered with a thin plate of hard snow on the centre of which a bait is laid a wall is built round it over which it is necessary for the wolf to leap before he can reach the bait he does so and falls to the bottom of the pit which is too narrow to give him room to make a spring to the top i may now say a few words about our travelling companion ivitchuk who had behaved well throughout the journey we found him always willing and obedient and generally lively and cheerful except when very tired which was frequently the case as he had not been accustomed to travel so many days consecutively he accommodated himself easily to our manners and customs in every respect living as we did though he would swallow a piece of seal's blubber now and then as a delicacy what surprised me most was that he was by no means a very great eater being often satisfied with as little as any of the party tea and chocolate were favourite beverages with him and he had learned to smoke his pipe as regularly as if he had been accustomed to it all his life he picked up a few words of english which he made use of whenever he thought they were applicable and was very anxious to be taught to read and write as he like the rest of the party was much thinner than when he had commenced the journey he had made up his mind to do nothing during the remainder of the spring but eat drink and sleep a determination to which i believe he most strictly adhered it was with no small pride that he received a gun and some ammunition as a reward for his services and a few presents to his wife one of the best looking of the fair sex of repulse bay made the pair quite happy although it was said that the lady had not behaved very well to her liege lord during his absence having taken unto herself another husband named Uplik, but probably the good man knew nothing or cared little about it part of the men were now every day occupied in scraping among the snow for moss and heather of which a sufficient quantity was procured to keep the kettle boiling 
on sunday the ninth divine service was read and thanks offered to the almighty for having guided us in safety through the late journey many eskimo were present who conducted themselves with propriety End of chapter 6